This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Ahead of us on this Monday's program, we start with Caitlin McCulloch, the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. She's joining us for this week's cattle market update, where she shares the slight drop in feeder cattle prices and the surprising pre-estimate import data for China. From the K-State Carl and Melinda Helwig Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering, Tani Larson joins us for National Farm Safety and Health Week. She shares information about programs occurring throughout the week and about the ROPS rebate program that she is hoping to bring to Kansas. We end today's program with K-State Aquatics and Fishery Specialist Joe Gherkin. He addresses the relationship between building good habitats for fish and minimizing parasites. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now for our weekly cattle market update starting off Monday morning. And covering it this week, we have with us Caitlin McCulloch. She is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center out of Colorado. So, Caitlin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we were chatting beforehand and we mentioned slow kind of week in terms of the grand scheme of things. But let's start off with feeder cattle specifically. Anything crazy there? Feeder cattle might be the most exciting thing that happened, especially in your neck of the woods last (laughs) week. Feeder cattle in Dodge City took quite a bit of a hit from the prior week. We were down about 10 to $15 across a couple of uh, the weight groups. Mostly on the lighter weight cattle side, if you look at 400 to, let's say, about 650 or 700 pounds, all of those fell probably 4 to $15 a hundred weight over the prior week. Now, if you look at some of the heavier weight cattle, this is all on the cash market out of Dodge City. Those two slipped a little bit, but it was a little more mixed. Uh, heavier weight cattle seemed to maintain what week ago was roughly in the 160s for 800 pound plus, but seven and eights also took a little bit of a hit from the prior week. Now that's a little bit different than what's happened in the futures market for feeder cattle. If we look at some of these fall contracts, specifically the October one, last week it fell pretty substantially. It was positive when it ended the week, but we definitely were week over week a little bit lower. That contract's at 181 at the close of Friday. On the fed cattle side, um, we're holding 142 on Friday for Live steers FOB 142.89, so still a very strong price out there for fed cattle. The futures market was a little choppy last week and closed the week slightly, ever so slightly above last week on on the close. But it was a little bit of a mixed bag throughout the week. Box beef, there's been a little bit of concern over the last, uh, let's say, 10 days or so. As we've seen that choice value fall. We're now firmly in the 250s range and you know we were about 252 to close the week last week so the lowest price we've seen in quite some time just keep in mind the box beef on average this year has been above a year ago and above the five year well above historical norms Um, but we also haven't seen nearly as much seasonality as normally we would expect Uh, box beef to fall during this time at least to some degree as we change over from summer grilling meats back into more of our winter warmers, as some might like to call them, you know, the pot roasts and crock pot type items. So the first time we're actually seeing things play out as expected for this year in terms of box beef. So that's kind of interesting to see that that trend kind of follow suit. But in terms of some of the discrepancies we've seen in feeder cattle specifically, what do you think kind of caused that in the last week? Well, week over week, I don't like to put too much emphasis on it. You are heading into uh, a time of year where typically you start to see more feeder cattle enter the market, although there has been a lot of drought movement. And so that might be a volume type of proposition, depending on what's going on state by state. But generally speaking, this is the time of year where we would expect feeder cattle values to soften. You've also had a a pretty dramatic change in the feed costs from where we've been. So you recall at the beginning of the year, a huge rally in corn costs, but then we thought we might have a better corn crop and they fell over a dollar in most places. Those have started to come back up as USDA has lowered yield and took about a million acres out of uh, planted for corn. So feeder cattle prices are being influenced by higher feed costs and, and generally a higher 
speed outlook than maybe they were even just a month ago. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense then for sure. And we were chatting beforehand about the export data that we haven't had for the last four weeks now. They finally released something this past week. So what did that really show? So this has been something that maybe we don't emphasize all the time because it is preliminary data. What it's telling us is what sales have happened. And so that doesn't necessarily translate to me export. Those things can get canceled, moved around or shipped at a different time than maybe you're expecting. But to go a whole month without the information, um, you know, it rattled the markets a little bit, especially on the pork side when it came back out. But in general, over those four weeks compared to a year ago, and I'm talking about mid-August, so 818 through 98 is the data we're referencing, was down about 8%. So maybe not a positive necessarily number, but it helps us know where we're at. And on the pork side, I think that was down about 10%. When we look at different countries, and that can be some of the more interesting things, especially since so much of beef export growth has come from China this year, it's kind of interesting to look at those numbers. So China was actually down in that four-week period compared to a year ago, about 3%. A couple other countries, you know, in that 5 to 10% loss range. In, but a couple interesting countries that were up, Canada was up 3% during that time period. Mexico also had a very strong month or four week period, I should say. They're up 20% in terms of volume. And so these numbers can shift around. We won't get actually, um, you know, that August data until the first week of October, and we won't get September until the month after that. So something we kind of keep an eye on to, to at least give us a barometer of what's happening, but definitely helpful for the industry to know. And the, the futures market definitely reacted to it this week with that information coming back online. Absolutely. And is some of that to blame on the strength of the U.S. dollar that we're currently seeing relative to some of these other countries in terms of, you know, where China is deciding to get exports from or imports, I guess, for them? I think the exchange rate always plays a role and in the U.S. dollar being stronger doesn't necessarily help, especially when our beef prices are already very high um, and, and scheduled to get higher if you look at the outlay. It's been interesting to watch. I think we do have this sense of global uncertainty, recession, uh, rising interest rates across the world. All those things are are playing into this. And and U.S. beef isn't getting any cheaper. And so it might have something to do with what's happening in each of these countries' economies. Beef is a relatively higher priced option. Um, We have seen a little bit more interest in pork as of late. So if you think about pork exports, we've had pretty big declines every month, almost the entire year. And that gap's narrowed substantially. So we're looking at quantities more similar to a year ago, down about only 5%, I believe, in the last month. And so we're looking at fall, seasonal buying from China might take an uptick. I would expect pork to move a little bit better this fall in terms of where it's been relative to earlier in the year. And on beef, I'm really watching that price and to see what happens. Again, we've been pretty reliant on China being the taker of U.S. beef, which has been great for the industry. But if we see any slowdown there, that's what we're going to watch out for. Absolutely. Yeah. Demand in the U.S. kind of waning with inflation rates getting even higher and higher. So we've really been, like you mentioned, relying heavily on export demand to kind of help even that out a bit. But in terms of where you see inflation going, I know the inflation report kind of came out earlier last week. And in terms of that, not a lot of optimism, right? Unfortunately, I'm a pessimist, so I wouldn't, I'm not expecting it to get substantially better. It looks like the Fed's going to raise interest rates and try and com- combat it. Now, the thing to keep in mind is if the CPI does not go any higher, as in just stays flat the rest of the year, you'd still be looking at a 6 plus percent interest rate in December. So that's a pretty powerful number to say, hey, even if things don't go up, it's still going to be very high inflation relative to historical standards. I probably don't think we're going to be able to stay even. We'll probably go up slightly, but the rate of change has slowed down. And I think that's important to recognize. I had someone tell me uh, just last week that uh, they saw $8 a pound butter. And I know we don't talk about dairy necessarily on this podcast, but if you think about what a consumer might do. I mean, I would do a lot less baking if I had to pay $8 a pound for butter. And so those types of conversations or even mental awareness is going to continue to wear on the consumer. And two, the length at which they've been dealing with these increased prices, they might just start to be making different choices. Those savings rates have come down. Things might look a little different than they did last year when we first started to see that high inflation number. 
Absolutely. I think at the beginning of all this, we were all a little more optimistic and thinking, well, you know, I can put up with these prices for a little while. But as you mentioned, the prolonged period that we've experienced it now at this point, consumers are definitely going to have to give at some point. And this is the number one question we have for beef and beef demand is, do you see some changing of volume of beef that U.S. consumers are It's difficult to say. I mean, demand has been a lot stronger than we anticipated given where prices have been in the last 12 months. And does that start to erode beef demand at some point? Something we'll all be looking out for in the coming months ahead. I think that as we go into the winter when demand starts to wean off kind of anyways, it'll be interesting to see if it sloughs off even more than we anticipate because of that. But like I said, something we'll keep an eye on for sure. But Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Once again, that was Caitlin McCulloch. She is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, joining us for this week's cattle market update. Still ahead, Tawny Larson joins us because this week is National Farm Safety and Health Week. She's sharing information about programs occurring, as well as information about the ROPS rebate program that she's hoping to bring to Kansas. Also still ahead, we have K-State's aquatics and fishery specialist, Joe Gherkin. He's addressing the relationship between building good habitats and minimizing the risk of parasites in our ponds. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. Culture today. We are back now with Tawny Larson from the Department of Bio Ag and Engineering here at K State. She's joining us today because this week is National Farm Safety and Health Week. And we're really just going to be chatting today about some important reminders for producers to keep in mind as they go about their daily practices and just in general, some programs available to help with some of those safety practices as well. So, Tawny, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Like I mentioned, this week is the 2022 National Farm Safety and Health Week. So, tell us a little bit about this program. So, each year we have a National Farm Safety and Health Week. And this year, the theme is protecting agriculture's future. And this week is a good reminder to think about some educational opportunities that are available. And although agriculture can be considered one of the most dangerous occupations in the nation, with safety measures in place, producers can lower their chances of having a serious accident. Some of those programs are offered through the AgriSafe network, from what I understand. Right. AgriSafe is a fabulous network. It's throughout the U.S. They're primarily online, and the program was started by nurses that worked in rural hospital settings and saw the need where physicians weren't paying as much attention to some of the issues that they're hearing from patients. And so the nurses really stepped up and they started this program. And so they offer webinars throughout the year. But this year, during um, Ag Safety Week, they're really concentrating on roadway safety for both the general public and equipment operators, ATV and UTV safety, mental health and suicide prevention, grain bin and confined space of safety, and many more webinars that are available by registering on their website or can be accessed at a later date too. Absolutely. Started by nurses. I had no idea. Wow, that's incredible. You wear a lot of different hats, obviously. I feel like every time before we record, I'm like, okay, what are we going to call you this episode? (laughs) Just depending on what we're talking about. But you also serve as the project coordinator for the Kansas ROPS rebate program. So share a little bit about that as well. So the ROPS rebate program is something that we've been working on here in Kansas for the last couple of years. And we actually are a partner with the Northeast Center on Ag Safety and Health. And something that um, has come out of this partnership is really concentrating on ag producers and the safety of producers out in the field and um, while driving tractors. And so ROPS rebate program is something that we're going to be hopefully kicking off here to have some type 
type of rebate program available to producers. So one important aspect of ag safety is to remember that our farmers and ranchers are part of our rural communities in in our areas. Losing a producer to an accident can affect so much more than the operation of the farm. So I think keeping that in mind in a larger aspect that farm safety and ag safety and health really affects all of us. And ag safety has become more focused on the total worker health. So that includes healthy habits like sleep, diet, mental health, and of course, safety for the entire family around the farm, including equipment, as we mentioned before, like tractors and ATVs. Hearing, vision, and skin protection are also very important topics, and just being very much aware of our surroundings. And that's where the mental health side comes in. Um, We all hear about how farmers have a high suicide rate, stress levels are high, um, depression is high, but taking care of yourself and doing some self-care to manage stress is very important. And having mental clarity is important in safety. Mindfulness, paying attention to where you are and what you're doing is very important so that our minds don't wander. For example, like in a rollover accident, maybe it's something that the a producer has done hundreds of times, but on that particular day, just something was a little bit amiss. And I think we can all talk about our experiences where I wasn't paying attention, my mind was someplace else, I tripped and fell or I dropped something. And so I think that is something that producers can kind of pay attention to themselves and to their family members. You know, when they see somebody walk out the door, they're getting ready to go work in the field. Hey, take a minute, take a deep breath. That kind of thing is, you know, you're all right. So it's okay to ask others if they're all right. And it's also okay to ask for help when you need it. Absolutely. Yeah. I can think of multiple occasions where, you know, the mundane of day to day, you kind of just, like you said, lose your trail of thought or your mind wanders. Mm -hmm. And I think about a producer sitting in a tractor for hours on end, and it'd be hard to imagine that they're completely cognizant and aware the entire time. So it's something easy to happen to anybody, honestly. So some good reminders there. And I know that part of this week, there also includes some programming available for women in ag specifically. There are. So this week, AgriSafe is programming related to keeping our bones strong. And so that's really important for all women, but especially women in ag, as we're out working and lifting and bending and that kind of thing, it can help reduce strain and long-term medical issues, injury, and that type of thing. So we know that women work really hard, and we also have to know that we need to work smarter because we don't have that brute strength that a lot of men have. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's a matter of utilizing um, some different equipment. Maybe it's a dolly or a cart or having things up on a shelf rather than things on the ground where you have to bend over to pick up a sack a feed or something to make it easier on our joints. And then if there has been injury in the past, also preventing secondary injury. And so all that is important within um, ag safety in general. And then this focus on protecting our future, I think, really speaks for how agriculture is changing and more women getting involved in production. With that also comes to mind, you know, some of these safety measures when it comes to protecting children that are around agriculture day to day. That's also, of course, very important. There's some programming surrounding that as well. Yes, there is. One program that we work a lot with is the Children's Ag Safety Network. And that also includes children that are youth working on the farm as well as youth on the farm. And those are very different. Mm -hmm. And so some of the programming focuses on Women during pregnancy working around chemicals and, you know, other environmental issues as well as the lifting and and that type of thing I mentioned before. And also child care practices when working on the farm. Where are your children? What's the plan? We want to make sure that they're safe and they learn to respect the equipment and livestock and so that you can go out and you can get your work done and the children are safe someplace else. Good reminders for sure when it comes to safety in general. But once again, we mentioned earlier that you are the project coordinator for the Kansas ROPS rebate program. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because really this program, once it's in place and ready to go for producers to take advantage of, it's really going to be such an important opportunity for them to be aware of. It is. And there are other states in the U.S. that have successful programs. And we've worked with the Northeast Center to see what is needed here in Kansas. And we have noticed that based on the accidents that we've had in Kansas, roughly there's been 10 farmers that we've lost due to overturns and approximately six farmers due to serious injury of rollovers in the last eight years. So it is something that 
is near and dear to many people. There are usually accidents that are not reported, and so they may have experienced it amongst their family, and um, so there may be more that we just don't know about. But let me just explain a little bit about ROPS. It is an acronym for a rollover protective structure. Some people call them roll bars or roll cages. Um, They're typically a piece of equipment that is used to prevent serious injury on a tractor overturn. But they're also something that um, was not required in the U.S. to be installed on equipment until the 1980s. And so there's a lot of equipment out there on the farms people use on a daily basis, and they're not equipped with this important, easy-to-install device that can save lives. I think a lot of people have equipment, like you said, from before the 1980s when this was required by that point. And it's probably something they're not thinking of often because they're like, well, I've used this equipment for years. Years, decades now at this point, I've never had an issue with it before now. But there's always that one opportunity that'll change a lifetime and then a community potentially forever. So good reminder of these opportunities for sure when it comes to acquiring this ROPS equipment. And that's really what this program is about, right, Tani? Encouraging producers to really get this equipment when they need it. Absolutely. And one um, stat that I found that was very interesting is that about half of our farms in Kansas are without ROPS. Wow. And that is a huge amount of equipment out there that's used on a regular basis that would with a simple device on it could help later on save someone from a serious injury or from death. And they're very cost effective. In the ROPS rebate program, typically a ROPS costs around $1,200. And so the program provides information to a farmer. They want to have a roll bar put onto their tractor. They can work with this and figure out exactly what piece of equipment fits. And then they go ahead and order it, have it installed. And then the typical program provides for the producer to pay less than $500 to have the ROPS installed. And so that's about a 70% rebate. So in a sense, it's the most cost-effective way to prevent serious injury and death. And so hopefully as we move forward, the program can be instituted here in Kansas and we can see a difference in what the program makes and how many lives it saves. Absolutely. And I understand that with the hope of initiating this program, there's a sign-up opportunity for producers if they're interested and once this program starts up to get involved. Absolutely. So the way the program works right now is there is a waiting list for each state that does not provide any funding for the rebate program now. And that's an easy website to go to. It's ropsforus.org. So someone can go in and they can sign up, get on the waiting list and talk with someone about the different types of devices that are needed, and then be ready to go if we do move forward. Here's hoping that that program does get instated here in Kansas, because like you mentioned, we really do need it. And I also just wanted to take a moment to say thank you, Tawny, and to encourage producers to really utilize and visit the tools that we talked about today. So whether that's through the AgriSafe network that we mentioned earlier, or if it's signing up for the ROPS waitlist program as well. So I will have both of those linked in the show notes to today's program, and hopefully listeners will tune in and take advantage of that for sure. But thank you for your time, Tawny. Thank you, Samantha. I appreciate it. This is such an important topic that we can share with more Kansans. And the more information and education people have, the safer they'll be. We'll be back with more on agriculture today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now for our weekly wildlife segment. And covering it this week, we have with us Joe Gherkin. He is our aquatics and fisheries specialist here at K-State. So, Joe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me back, as always. Absolutely. So today we're going to talk about habitats in aquatic areas and how imbalances in that can actually lead to parasites. So let's start off with habitats. When we're looking at ponds, one of the most important factors is that we have the right habitat for the fish to thrive. And so a lot of times when we think about habitat, we're thinking about, you know, big places to go catch big fish. That's what fishermen tend to think about. But it's also really important to think about little fish in places that they can hide. And so when we're looking at habitat, we want to kind of have a variety where we have small habitat close to the shore but that that goes into deeper habitat where there's some bigger openings. So if you think about a tree, the top of a tree laying up near the bank, and then kind of some of the bigger branches, you know, in six or eight feet of water, that's kind of what we're trying to recreate. And one of the important things to consider there as well is vegetation. And so a lot of people are calling me saying, I have too much vegetation. I want to get rid of all of it. If we get rid of all of it, those little fish don't have anywhere to hang out. So we really need to make sure we have some of those plants. That's really good habitat for fish. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess there's a connection here, a connection between habitat and then food availability for some of these species of fish. Yeah. So those plants are a great example. And so when we're looking at any of these habitats, they're the baseline for a lot of food. And so we think about phytoplankton, which is algae floating around in the water. And a lot of organisms, a lot of small organisms are getting food from that. But they can also get food from something called periphyton, which is a colony of bacteria and nutrients that kind of establish on wood or rocks after a period of about six months in water. If you ever walk up to a tree or rocks in the water and you kind of rub them, there's a little film on there. That film it has a lot of nutrients in it. And so that can provide a base for the food structure for your pond. I know you've been getting a lot of calls about concerns over parasites lately, and one specifically is coming to mind. Yeah. And so the yellow grub is what we tend to see most in Kansas, and that is a trematode. And so their life cycle is really fascinating. It has an intermediate host, which is a snail. And so the snail is where the parasite grows up. And then the fish goes and eats that snail. And the parasite then hatches and becomes embedded into the fish. Now, there's a lot of variations in that cycle, but that's kind of the process. So the bugs eat the parasite, right? We talked about that. And then the intermediate hosts are these snails. So if we have too much vegetation, we can get our snail populations to grow really high. And the fish are eating those snails, and then that can lead to seeing these grubs in the fish. Now, one important part of this process that I'm leaving out are birds. And so birds can actually transport the eggs or the larvae from one habitat to another. So they'll go eat a fish or they'll eat a snail and they'll fly to another pond. So that transport is really common. What we want to try to keep under control are the numbers, snails that are in our pond. So one way we can do that is to introduce a fish called a red ear sunfish. Shell crackers is a common name for them. They really like to eat those snails and, and disrupt this whole process. So if parasites are present, what are some signs of that? You'll see like little white specks on the fish. A lot of times you'll see it in the gills, on their mouth, in the fillets themselves. It's really important to point out out that generally these don't harm the fish. If they get in really high numbers, they can be harmful. They can get in the gills and make it hard for them to breathe. You can see worse body conditions, so declines in the body condition where fish will look really skinny. If they get to those numbers where there's really high densities, really we need to get those fish out of the pond. But most of the time, you know, it's part of a natural system. So it's okay that they're there. The fish can kind of adapt to it. And the fillets are still safe to eat, which is an important thing to point out. So as long as the fillets are properly cooked, they're still safe to eat. So you'll see them commonly on fish. Unless they're in really high densities, it's probably okay. The cooking temperature, a very key indication there. That's with yes. all things, of course. It is. Safety. Food safety. Yep. Yes. If producers are tuning in and they're thinking, I'm kind of wary of, I think I might have parasites that are causing issues in my ponds and they're looking for more information on how to control it, where can they find that information? So a lot of the research is in aquaculture systems. So reaching out to the Kansas Aquaculture Association, talking to them would be a great resource. As always, reach out to your local extension agent. We have publications and resources there that they can share with you. You can obviously reach out to me as well. Absolutely. We'll have some of those resources linked in the show notes of today's program, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But Joe, thank you you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Once again, that was Joe Gherkin. He is our aquatics and fishery specialist here at K-State covering habitats and how imbalances in those systems can potentially lead to parasites. We'll be back with more tomorrow on Agriculture Today. <laughs>